Blurring Boundaries, The Women of the American Abstract Artist from 1936 to the Present is currently on view in the South Bend Museum of Art's Warner Gallery through January 3rd of 2021. Blurring Boundaries is a traveling exhibition curated by Rebecca Di Giovanna and organized by the Claire M. Eagle Gallery at Murray State University, the Ewing Gallery at the University of Tennessee, and is toured by International Arts and Artists in Washington, D.C., which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to increasing cross-cultural understanding, as well as exposure to the arts internationally through exhibitions, programs, and services to artists, arts institutions, and the public. All right, so there's a lot to unpack here, but let's start with the title. The American Abstract Artists are a group founded during the Great Depression at a time when abstract art was not given the respect or validation within the larger art world due to its vast differences from the European avant-garde. Established in 1936, the women of the AAA, as we'll call them, experienced a very particular set of circumstances. At the time, and especially in art, women were not considered equal to men. At the same time, the male American artists working in abstraction weren't receiving equal treatment in the world of abstract art, seeing their European peers receive all of the attention in their own city, which was New York. In some ways, this put the women and the men of AAA on equal playing grounds and quite possibly gave the AAA the strength to move forward as a unified group. The curatorial committee at the South Bend Museum of Art chose this show for the 2020 American Series exhibition in order to celebrate the 100-year anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. As we work through the exhibition in this video, we will talk a little bit about the historical context around the founding of this group and some of the major movements in women's history along the way. We'll also talk about what Di Giovanna refers to as the guiding principles of abstract art. So let's travel back in time to put this exhibition in context. In 1917, this French artist named Marcel Duchamp turned a urinal upside down. He signed it with the pseudonym R. Mutt and then submitted it to an art exhibition um, within a group that he actually founded, along with some others, called the Society of Independent Artists. The constitution of this society stated that all the work submitted for exhibition by members be shown. The society made an exception when Duchamp submitted Fountain, which was the urinal, stating that it was not acceptable as art because A, it was a urinal, a sanitation object, for goodness sake, and then it really was kind of a crude thing that they wouldn't put in pub in a public space like that. Um, so therefore, they weren't going to consider it art. Because of the society's dismissal of the freedom it was founded upon, Duchamp resigned from his membership to the society in protest to the lack of support towards an artist's freedom in this newfound American society. Duchamp called this work and subsequent others ready-mades. This seemingly simple piece, whether one thinks it's art or not, notes a landmark moment in 20th century avant-garde art and marks the moment when our definition of art changed from a focus on technical achievement to a focus on meaning, context, and process. Art was not necessarily tangible from this point on. Okay, so let's move forward a couple years to 1920, when women were granted the right to vote per the ratification of the 19th Amendment on August 18th, 1920. In short, this civil right was fought for for over half a century by way of the women's suffrage movement, when supporters lectured, wrote, marched, lobbied, and practiced civil disobedience to achieve this basic civil right. The sign depicted here was designed to be placed in the window of a home so that all who passed by the house would know that the woman within exercised her right under the 19th Amendment and registered to vote. It also served as a reminder to other women to do the same. By 1933, the Nazi regime was gaining power over in Europe. Notable German artist Hans Hoffmann moved to the U.S. permanently. 
Prior to his move, he spent years traveling to the U.S. for work as a teacher and eventually opened a school in New York as well as a summer school in Provincetown, Massachusetts. Hoffman was known for his teaching environments and for fostering the work of many notable abstract artists. His students were both men and women, even though he showed very little respect for women, often pointing out their gender when speaking highly of their work. So good you would not believe it was done by a woman. You'll amount to nothing. You'll never get anywhere. So the quote, so good you would not believe it was done by a woman, he was actually talking about Lee Krasner's work, which I'll put on the screen here. Um, And this was a compliment that he was paying to her. Um, And then you'll amount to nothing, you'll never get anywhere is something that he said to every woman at his school, attending his school, um, because they were women. So why did the female students stay? Well, it was a long time ago, and his school was an uncommon opportunity for these artists to work around a like-minded group of people that they would not find anywhere else in New York City. So they stuck it out, making the best of the resources they had access to. So now we're in 1936 when two major things happened. The year the first art piece included in the Blurring Boundaries exhibition was created. The second thing that happened was the Museum of Modern Art in New York City, or we'll call it MoMA, hung a famous exhibition called Cubism and Abstract Art. This exhibition primarily highlighted European abstract works of art and included very few American pieces. The exhibition was the main impetus for the creation of the American abstract artist shortly thereafter. In 1943, Peggy Guggenheim's gallery, Art of This Century, had an exhibition showing the works of 31 women artists. Disappointingly, some of the women approached for the exhibition refused, not wanting to be associated with women-only artists. The reception of art created by women was improving. There was still the fact that critics were less than supportive of their art on the basis of gender. Fast forward to the South Bend Museum of Art today in the most wonderful year of 2020, where you can experience the exhibition Blurring Boundaries, the women of the American abstract artist from 1936 to the present, both in person and virtually. Now, as we travel through the gallery, please consider what Rebecca Di Giovanna notes as the guiding principles of abstraction, material, color, light, space, and process. And if you can, keep Duchamp's fountain in mind as well. After all, that happened a mere 20 years prior to the first year this exhibition celebrates. Color is a great way to communicate universal feelings or ideas to a broad audience. There are lots of ways to do this. For example, what do these two colors remind you of? How about these two colors? Or these three colors? Or instead of symbolizing our nation's favorite fast food chain or politics, maybe we use color to communicate a tone or mood like this. While some artists explore the theory of color in order to explore how colors relate to one another visually, no matter what kind of painting we're looking at, abstract or representational, paintings are all about light. Light allows us to see an image. It allows us to see the folds in Susan Smith's French fry wrapper pieces, and it allows us to see the shadows and pencil marks on the wall relating to the hanging of Drip Dry by Mary Shalero. The really interesting thing about light regarding those two pieces is that the light is actually coming from a specific place in time, which can give the viewer a way into the work, since they're both accounted for in that time and space. I just pointed out two sort of three-dimensional works that allow for shadows, but what about a painting? If a painting is a representation of what the painter sees or experiences, the light captured in the painting can tell you a lot about what the artist values. Space is another element of art and considered a guiding principle of abstraction because of its power in composition. There's no denying that successful composition will hold the viewer's attention. Not only that, but an artist's effective use of positive and negative space can direct the viewer around and through an image. The most powerful and successful compositions use positive and negative space equally. And I don't mean equally in space, but equally in balance. Let's take a look at Clover Vale's piece number 14. 
This is an abstract composition that follows all the rules of a successful composition. It's not what we call a box within a box, which means all four corners of this composition are not foreground and all four corners are not background. And if you squint your eyes while looking at this work, you'll notice that the foreground and the background are interchangeable. We really can't tell if this is black on beige or beige on black, right? In fact, the image's abstract shapes move us in and out of the labyrinth of unexpected shapes, vacillating back and forth between foreground shapes and background shapes. Process is a super interesting point of focus that that became more pronounced as an aspect to consider when making and viewing artwork. Many artists create their own processes in making art based on their means or what was available to them in the studio. Other artists used developed processes to explore an object or idea when under the influence of the process. I like to think of process as a series of rules that an artist sets up to perform on a material. For example, Lynn Harlow's Sweetheart of the Rodeo is really about the viewer's experience of the piece, both from the perspective of looking in and the perspective of looking out from inside. The color changes as well during the viewer's process of looking and experiencing the piece. From the outside looking inward, the white plastic fringe hangs in front of a small room painted bright big bird yellow. But from the inside, you, are, you aren't looking through white stripes. And so the yellow becomes so much more intense of a color since it isn't being tinted with white. This piece is all about the process of experiencing an artwork from both the inside and the outside. It even starts to remind me of the process of color mixing and color theory as well. So if we go back to Susan Smith's SCT 200 Irregular Grid, which I was referring to as French fry wrappers earlier, Susan says, I find these everyday fast food takeout containers on the street. They're flat, irregular shapes resulting from cars, trucks, and pedestrian traffic moving over them. This chance process has, al has also altered their colors and grid patterns into surprising forms. Leaving this flattened container untouched, I allow it to dictate my response, continuing the color and grid pattern, which leads me to unexpected abstract form. In some cases, this results in a trompe l'oeil. And finally, let's talk about material. This is such an important principle in abstract art and an entryway into understanding any work of art. Mary Shalero paints strips of mylar and suspends them from nails that pierce through clothespins. She titles this piece, Drip Dry. One's knowledge of the traditional use of clothespins can't help but be tied to the title of the piece, showing the viewer an ever-changing story of women's work. Material might be my favorite way to enter a work of art. When talking to artists about their work, I tend to rely heavily on conversation about their choice of material and their process, whether it's representational art or abstract art. So come see the show, bring your friends and bring your masks. We'd love to see you. Or please take a look at our virtual tour and classroom available through this link on our website. Thanks so much for your time. I hope you enjoyed the tour.